I thought it'd be interesting to talk about this, uh, this topic this morning is uh, various nutritional supplements. This is something that I'm asked uh, literally every single day, I'm asked in the office about, you know, well, what can I take to make my heart better? What can I do to make my heart better? That's not medicine. That's not uh, a statin or a beta block or a medicine like that. And, uh, and so I thought I'd share the information with you and, and see and kind of share some of the data with you. Um, and, uh, and, and tell you, essentially share with you um, what, is, uh, what is currently known. Um, the use of, of various herbal supplements and dietary supplements among America's elderly is very high. Uh, by 2010, over 63% uh, over of patients uh, were taking either an herbal or dietary supplement like ginseng, ginkgo biloba, glucosamine, and we'll talk about many, many others um, during the talk. And uh, in one study of uh, over 3,000 patients uh, who were aged uh, over 75, almost three quarters had taken, had taken an additional supplement in addition to, uh, to a medication. Why is this so interesting or why is it so common? It's, uh, it's a, I guess it's also a kind of a drive of, of people that, you know, we want to do what's, what's best for our health and we are very acutely aware of the uh, risks and side effects of potential medications and these supplements that are marketed um, kind of have a promise of delivering some of the benefit in terms of uh, preventing heart disease or addressing heart disease, um, but potentially without, without the side effect. Uh, but as, I, as I'll share with you, and some of you may be disappointed to see, the benefits are actually not as, uh, not as clear as, um, as, as advertised or as we'd like to believe. So the first thing we'll talk about is fish oil. This is something that's really, really widely used, uh, uh, widely advised by physicians as well, and, um, and, and I think would be useful for us to talk about. The idea of fish oil as a beneficial substance or as, as a beneficial product um, is about is about 50 years old at this point or, or even older. Uh, they were doing, uh, various researchers around the world were doing various uh, studies and, and looking into populations who had good health. And what they realized is that there was a group of uh, Greenland Eskimos um, who tended to live uh, very long and to have a very a little ev episodes of heart disease. And when they analyzed their lifestyle, one of the things that they noticed is that these people were consuming very high amounts of, uh, of seafood. And so that was kind of one of the um, one of the things that that was uh, um, kind of moving the, the research that way and also there were certain uh, uh, populations or pockets within Japan where there were people who were living a very into advanced stage as well and there were questions about their longevity and the and the secret as well and uh, and so that began kind of uh, through these po after following these population studies began some more and more work in terms of uh, evaluating the effects and uh, and benefits of fish oil. When we talk about fish oil, uh, what it's important to keep our definitions and important to keep our kind of words and concepts straight. There is uh, several different types of fish oil, but fish oil itself is broken down, has three major components. And this is EPA, DHA and ALA. When you guys, if you're at the, at the pharmacy or at the health market or at the health store and you look at a bottle that, or your a physician may even prescribe it, uh, they may prescribe uh, fish oil, what you're looking at is EPA and DHA. That's the primary, that's the primary uh, type of fish oil that seems to have the most, uh, the most benefit. And so that's, that's, what, that's what we're talking about. ALA is a different, um, it's a slightly different product that's uh, less relevant. Um, this may be a little bit small for, for people to see, but I wanted to kind of um, highlight some of the potential benefits. And, and it'll be important to keep in mind, I, I will share some of the potential benefits. These are things that were seen in small studies. These are uh, things that were seen in animal studies as well. But the question is, does this translate into actual benefit for, for us as consumers? And that's going to be, uh, that's going to be um, that I'll share with that. And so early on, there was uh, some signs or some, some signs, encouraging signs that maybe with fish oil, the triglycerides would be better, uh, that there would be lowering of blood pressure. There are some um, studies that indicated that platelet activity were better to make to where the platelets would be less sticky and therefore have less uh, side effects or less um, heart attacks. Uh, there were some small studies that showed, well, maybe there's some benefit in terms of heart uh, arrhythmias, in terms of fixing the rhythm issues of the heart. And so 
th that's why we were um, initially a lot more optimistic about fish oil. And uh, one of the th important studies that came out was a study that came out uh, last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. So New England Journal of Medicine is one of the biggest, most prestigious, one of the oldest and most prestigious medical journals that we have. And the studies that I'll share with you guys today are studies that involve thousands and thousands of patients. And so that's the way we build up our, uh, we build up our knowledge base and we, we really kind of rely on it. You can question everything, you can question the methodology of each study, uh, but ultimately, ultimately, you know, that's kind of the best that, that, that we currently have. And so there was a very large trial called VITAL. And VITAL analyzed uh, the benefits or the role of vitamin D and fish oil. Vitamin D we'll get back to, but fish oil is what we'll talk about now. So this was the largest, most ethnically diverse uh, trial. It focused on primary prevention. What is primary prevention? Primary prevention is when you're dealing with, when you're trying to avoid a heart attack or a stroke. So we're talking about a person who's never had a heart attack or stroke, is simply looking for medicines or supplements that will help them and, and, uh, and aid them. And so what was interesting about the trial that it, uh, the kind of the main takeaway from the, from the study and everywhere in the news media and everywhere, including the actual publication itself and the authors, what we call the top line, the top line result was that omega-3 did not significantly reduce major cardiovascular events, uh, which was the trial's primary outcome. And uh, what are major cardiovascular events? Major cardiovascular events are strokes, heart attacks, deaths, kind of all in one as one main outcome. But what's interesting is that if you kind of looked in a little bit deeper into the, into the results, it seemed that the specifically heart attacks were in fact reduced with uh, with fish oil so the t there was a 20 percent reduction for heart attacks 20 uh, 50 percent for fatal heart attacks and uh, and the 17 percent reduction for total coronary heart disease uh, events the effects were most pronounced in people with low dietary fish um, intake and also african-american patients so the primary endpoint was unaffected because it was a combination of of three cardiovascular outcomes, including two that were not reduced by treatment, which were stroke and death. But heart attacks seem to be, uh, seem to be in uh, indeed reduced with, uh, with fish oil. And so, but pulling this, all of this data together gave a, data, uh, gave a result that wasn't, uh, that wasn't positive. So there's some caveats to that. There's a lot of statistical um, big statisticians and big experts that question whether indeed you can make that um, whether you can really make that uh, uh, distinction and whether you can really say that the trial was positive when the outcome was, was not positive. But, uh, but overall, there was some, some insight that maybe there was some benefit specifically for heart attacks with fish oil. But the fact that, uh, still remains that strokes were clearly not better, were not reduced with, uh, with fish oil, and total overall mortality was not affected by, by people taking a fish oil supplement. What is total myocardial infraction? So, so, th so there's a, uh, what I'm, maybe I'm getting a little bit too nuanced, but ultimately there's a difference between total mortality, which means everyone who had passed away during the time of the trial, versus people who specifically had heart attacks. So overall, the numbers were the same on both sides in terms of who lived and who didn't. But in but terms of heart attacks... Myocardial infraction, does that mean you're dead? No, 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 there's no, you're, con you're, you're using the word incorrectly. There's no total myocardial infarction. Well, there's, on the screen. maybe I missed. Uh, yeah, I don't think, I don't see it. So there was, there was just it's a right stroke there. at that. That's what I mean. What is myocardial infarction? It's when you have, when you have a heart attack, when, when the artery is not supplying blood okay, to the heart. Whether you live or die. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So you can have that in both, in both events. And then there was another trial uh, that also looked at patients uh, with, uh, that also tried to assess the benefits of uh, fish oil. Um, and these were patients with diabetics, uh, patients who were diabetics. And these are patients who we know as a, uh, as a group, there's a higher risk 
of uh, a high risk of developing heart disease. And so we thought, well, if this group may particularly benefit from uh, fish oil supplementation, and this was a very large, uh, a very lengthy trial, also 15,000 patients were en enrolled who were followed for nearly seven years, and the outcome was essentially uh, the same. So the ASCEND was also considered a null omega-3 trial, meaning it wasn't positive, because the primary endpoint, again, a composite risk of total myocardial infarction, um, uh, vascular accidents, uh, were not significantly improved with, uh, with people taking fish oil. But, um, but as... Uh, but specifically cardiovascular death, meaning specifically heart attacks, were, were reduced with fish oil. So there's something that's specifically for heart that's, that seems to be beneficial with fish oil, but in terms of other causes of death, like a stroke, are not, are not beneficial with, with fish oil. And the next question that's often asked is, what are the best sources, uh, what are the best sources of, of, uh, of fish oil and how should I get fish oil from the diet? And uh, really the best sources of omega-3 fatty acids are salmon, herring, anchovies, sardines, and rainbow trout. This is a picture of a wild, uh, of a wild um, salmon. And there is uh, some data that wild is better and does have higher percentages of the beneficial types of uh, fatty acids than uh, farm-raised uh, fish. Um, and uh, it's these fishes, uh, fish that I've laid out before that are more beneficial than other white fish like tilapia, uh, which have lower omega-3 content. In the studies, were they taking fish oil supplements? Correct. Okay. Yeah, they were. The, the, that's the, that was the comparison. A group of patients was taking it one gram per day of the fish oil supplements, and another, and another was not. And that's, that's, that, that's how they drew the comparison. Um, I'll do questions. I'll do questions at the end, and I'll stick around for for as long as as needed. Um. So the other, so we'll talk about other other supplements. Uh, as I said, uh, they're uh, supplements and minerals for cardiovascular prevention. These are really uh, where, uh, very widely used, and over 40% uh, of adults, 49% of adults, uh, use a supplement. But a very small fraction of them are um, are prescribed by by the physicians. The overall kind of the overall point or the overall. Uh, uh, takeaway is is really summarized here. The U.S. Preventative T uh, Services Task Force. This is the main body that lays out all of the recommendations for the for the entire country in terms of health screenings. So this is the body that lays out whether we should get mammograms, when and for whom, whether we should get colon uh, colonoscopies, when and for whom, whether we should have an EKG when we visit a doctor's office, when and for whom. So this is really the most authoritative body that uh, of scientists uh, that work together and try to compile all of the data and so overall uh, they, they their say their statement is that is that the current evidence for use of multivitamins uh, to prevent cardiovascular disease is insufficient um, and uh, next we'll talk about some of the common multivitamins that I think uh, that I think may be uh, may be useful uh, uh, overall, they're, they're the most commonly consumed dietary supplements among adults in the U.S., and they tend to be more common use among women uh, compared to men. Uh, next, I'll share another interesting study. This is called the, the Physician's uh, Health Study. This was published in 2012, so several years ago, and it's... Um, uh, it's a, it was, what was done is that they followed a group of physicians, these were male physicians, but there were 15 or nearly 15,000 of them who were followed for over 10 years. And again, to, to, to the question about how the study was done, the, the study was kind of what's considered the gold standard study. This is a randomized study, a double blind, placebo control. So what, what does that mean? It means they took two groups of physicians, the, and there's also caveats. You know, these are male physicians, the fact that they were physicians. There's questions of whether how applicable this data is to, to everyone, but th it is what it is. This is just the data we have to, to work with from this specific trial. But basically, just to speak a little bit about the way the trial was designed, is that this is really what's considered the gold standard, and why? It's because both groups were taking a medication. One was taking the medication 
medication and that was actually the multivitamin and another one was taking a placebo. The person taking the specific uh, supplement didn't know if they were simply getting a sugar pill or if they were getting uh, an actual multivitamin and so therefore why, what's the point of that? The point of that is to get rid of the placebo effect so because when people take a medicine sometimes they say well I feel better already I feel more energetic and I'm doing better because of this medicine is working so well for me and here they didn't know if they were indeed taking a real medication uh, were indeed were taking a real medication uh, or not and uh, and why does it mean double blind that means that the people who were studying them throughout the conduct the duration of the study also didn't know so when they would come in for their regular follow-ups the doctors or nurses who were evaluating them at those visits also didn't know if they were indeed taking a real supplement or not so that's considered really the best way and uh, and and randomized so you would choose randomly who would get the medicine who would not and so that's really the best way to kind of get rid of all of the other potential factors and really evaluate the medicine uh, uh, itself and uh, really the main takeaway was was here is, is I, I have it in the third bullet is that really there was no significant benefit um, this is a graph that I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this is uh, major cardiovascular events uh, that's what the graph is shows and it shows us the cumulative incidence of major cardiovascular disease and this is called hazard ratio so as the years of follow-up go on the cumulative incidence of these events goes up. So over time, as you follow a group of patients, certainly more and more people under, in your study are going to end up having an event, right? But what, uh, what can you see here? There's actually, I don't know who can tell, but there's actually two lines here, but they're exactly on top of each other. The line that's in solid black was uh, multivitamin patients, and the, what, and the one that's uh, dashed line here is the placebo group, right? But they could see that they're, it's very difficult to really distinguish them. They're in Entirely, they entirely overlay, and statistically, they're not they're not different. So in the very end, you could see a tiny separation, but it's it's not statistically meaningful information. So so we from this uh, from this trial, we really said it didn't seem that this group uh, benefited from taking a a multivitamin. And you could see this is number of thousands of patients who were followed up throughout uh, throughout the study. So initially, they they uh, they started with uh, nearly 15,000 patients, and over the years, people people were lost to follow, but this is still a very robust, a very robust sample and a very robust um, uh, information, a piece of information. Um, next we'll talk about antioxidants. So this is really a, a topic that's very, very uh, widely, widely used. You walk into any store, you see antioxidant supplements, any juice bottles, tons and tons of uh, marketing and, uh, and just tons of uh, data out there about uh, antioxidants. What are, what are antioxidants? Uh, these are uh, micronutrients like selenium, uh, zinc, copper, manganese, and uh, the idea is, the, the theory behind antioxidants is that they work to uh, minimize the, the damage that's done by uh, oxygen-free radicals. So oxygen-free radicals are this byproduct of metabolism within the cell. And these are kind of, we can think of them as aggressive or very active uh, little particles that uh, are able to bounce around inside the cell. And the concern is that um, these free radicals can cause damage. They can cause damage to the inside of the cell, to the cell, the little organs within the cell, and also cell DNA, which can have long-term uh, damage as well. And uh, there's other types of antioxidants like vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, uh, and uh, they function. Uh, by uh, preventing oxidative damage to uh, mic macromolecules, like I said, uh, and one of them is LDL. So we know that LDL is a very big component and a very big cause in, in um, forming heart disease and creating heart disease and building up heart disease. Um, well, it's not simply LDL, it's a specific form of LDL, meaning oxidized form of LDL. And uh, there was a, a goal or hope, and this was seen in some of the initial smaller studies and some of the lab studies, that when you prevent this oxidative process of LDL, you make the LDL, quote, less, less bad or less dangerous to the person. And so there was some hope that maybe these antioxidants would, in fact, do that. Maybe if we take antioxidants, our LDL wouldn't be as atherogenic, meaning wouldn't be causing heart disease as much. And therefore, it would be, it would improve patient outcomes and, and lead to less, uh, less heart disease. So next I'll show you a couple studies that, uh, that try to um, answer this question in a big, 
uh, in a large population. So this uh, study was called SUVIMAX. It was published uh, several years ago now. And uh, again, just like the, the prior study that we went through in kind of a little bit of detail, this was a randomized placebo-controlled trial conducted in France. So again, randomized, meaning people who, were, who would receive the antioxidant tablets were chosen at random. They weren't people who needed them more, needed them less. Uh, placebo controlled, meaning the patients didn't understand or didn't know if they were indeed getting the antioxidant tablets or not. Um, and, uh, and the trial was, uh, went on for over seven and a half years. So another, again, another significant, uh, significant length of time for us to see if there was any benefit. And ultimately, the final outcome was that there was no significant difference between the two groups in terms of all-cause mortality or incidence of ischemic cardiovascular disease. So, so in, this, in this case, it, in this trial, antioxidants really were not, uh, were, were not beneficial. And uh, here is a takeaway from another uh, trial. It's actually not a trial. It's called a meta-analysis. What's a meta-analysis? A meta-analysis is when we combine several large trials and we pool all of the data together into one data set, and we try to extract uh, some understanding or some truth from that one data set in that trial. There's a lot of, uh, again, th this stuff gets a little bit uh, um, nuanced uh, in terms of is this a good idea or is this not a good idea to do these meta-analyses. The meta-analyses, the benefit is that it allows us to pull together several small trials and, uh, and hopefully arrive at some greater understanding of what's happening. But when we pull trials together, there's also some some error that ends up introduced as well. So these, uh, whenever you see, whenever you're reading anything in the newspapers or in, on the internet, and a, a meta-analysis is quoted, it's important to to keep in mind that there's some insight that's gained, but there's also some statistics that are that are kind of uh, questionable when we do it. Uh, but anyways, this is a paper that was published in in Jack the Journal of American College of Cardiology. So this is the, really the most authoritative journal that we have, or one of the most authoritative journals that we have within the field of cardiology. And this, this was a very recent analysis, just, uh, just two years ago. And there were 20 large randomized controlled trials that were pooled uh, together. And overall, it showed that there was no significant benefit of antioxidants for cardiovascular prevention or treatment, and even a trend uh, towards worsening all-cause mortality. So it's important to keep in mind that uh, overall, for the vast majority of people, taking a multivitamin, taking uh, an antioxidant supplement is completely benign. But as a whole, there is, it, it's, it's not really entirely benign. And as I'll share, there's side effects of other types of antioxidants. So it's, uh, you, we have to be, just because it's sold in a health food store, in a nature store, doesn't mean that it's entirely uh, benign. And especially it's concerning when the benefit isn't, uh, isn't very clear as I'm sharing you from, from these trials. Another pop uh, popular supplement and another popular topic is, uh, is vitamin D. So we thought or we hoped that vitamin D can prevent the oxygen. I, I, I apologize, we'll get to vitamin D. I'm talking about vitamin E, I, I apologize. Uh, so vitamin E uh, can prevent the oxidative, oxidative damage of uh, macromolecules such as LDL as I shared, and may have a potential role in reducing the cardiovascular a cardiovascular risk. Um, there was a large trial that was uh, published now nearly 15 years ago called the Women's Health Study, and this is one of the largest uh, one of the largest uh, studies that specifically followed women for for many years. So here you can see it's nearly 40,000 uh, women who were enrolled in the trial, and they were assigned to two groups: either vitamin E or placebo. Placebo, obviously, meaning no no medication, no active ingredient was there, and the um, follow-up was for over 10 years. So again, a large group followed for many, many years. And so that's, that's really heft in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of the power that the inf how much we believe the information. And uh, the, the part this article was published in JAMA, another very big uh, prestigious journal. And the follow-up or the, the, the main takeaway was that the all-cause mortality, meaning any kind of everything combined, do people live longer or they don't? And the answer is there was no difference in either group. So another, another trial that really put in question whether vitamin E supplementation was, uh, was beneficial.
Um, and uh, another trial was called SELECT, where it was selenium and vitamin E for cancer prevention trial, randomized patients to vitamin E, selenium, selenium plus vitamin E or placebo. So basically every, every form of combination. And again, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular events, cardiovascular death did not uh, significantly differ between, between all of the arms. Um, next is, uh, is niacin, vitamin, uh, vitamin B3. So niacin is actually a, a, a medicine that was prescribed by many, many physicians, also by many cardiologists for many years. Um, and uh, recently we've been, as I'll share with you, have been learning that it's, it's also not very beneficial for heart health. Um, niacin increases the role of HDL. The common wisdom and the common phrase is HDL is, quote, the good cholesterol. So we know that LDL is the bad cholesterol. And so we, we know that when we see our doctors, that's kind of the first number that we talk about is total cholesterol and LDL. And then HDL is always considered kind of the good cholesterol. It's important to keep, uh, to keep in mind the, the story on HDL is a lot less clear. When LDL is a bad cholesterol, that, that's clear. That, 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 that part of, of science of, of uh, clinical medicine is very clear. The role of HDL is a lot more nuanced. It's a different molecule that has a slightly different uh, role in the body and uh, it's a lot more nuanced. So usually we think of higher HDL levels as being better, but, not every, but it's not always that because it, the specific role of HDL differs whether you have a background healthy person or you, or you have a background person with systemic inflammation like rheumatoid arthritis or, or diabetes. So, so just, just as kind of a small aside and just a small aside about HDL, it's, the story isn't so clear. But at the time that these, uh, this trial was being done, we, we knew that we, we kind of had this basic understanding, HDL is good, would it be good, it would it be better if we raised the, uh, the level of HDL. And we knew from smaller studies that HDL didn't, uh, that um, niacin did indeed raise levels of HDL, and so that's what we were hoping for. And so there was a trial called AIM High, the atherothrombosis intervention in metabolic syndrome with low HDL, high triglycerides, and uh, there were 3,000, nearly 3,500 patients with known heart disease. Um, and these were patients who were already receiving a cholesterol-lowering medication, uh, simvastatin. But it's important to keep in mind, so here we're talking about secondary prevention. These are patient, patients who have already shown to have heart disease. So you can, you can argue both ways. Number one, well, maybe that's not as applicable to the wider population. But number two, well, these are the patients who would benefit the most. If there is a benefit to be gained from high HDL, the group with known heart disease would be the one to benefit the most. Um, and what was interesting and what was novel is that, yes, the HDL levels really did go up with, with therapy, but there was no significant difference in cardiac outcomes between both groups. So, so niacin was really... Uh, is niacin in simvastatin? No. No, no, no. It's a completely separate, uh, some completely separate medication. But uh, the point here is that patients were already getting appropriate, or what we think are probably appropriate therapy for, the, for their heart disease. And what was also seen is that patients in the niacin group had more adverse events, including liver function abnormalities, myopathy, rhabdomyolysis, when, when muscle tissue is, is breaking down, uh, compared to the placebo group. So as I shared, it's not, all, not all of the, uh, these supplements are, um, are benign. Now, the next one is an is a, is a interesting one as well. It's CoQ10. So CoQ10 is very, very widely known. A lot of patients may be taking it. A lot of people in this room may be taking it. A lot of the doctors prescribe it or recommend it as well. And uh, that's a, it's, it's, it's also one of these things that's kind of nuanced. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not a simple topic to, um, to cover in a, in a brief lecture. What is CoQ10? Another name for CoQ10 is ubiquinone. So when you're, when you're in the sh you know, at the store and you're looking at various labels, a lot of them simply say CoQ10, a lot of them say both CoQ10 and ubiquinone or just ubiquinone. Why is it called ubiquinone? It's called ubiquinone because it's ubiquitous, meaning this, uh, this little molecule is present throughout, uh, throughout our entire body. It seems to be that it's higher in certain organs. Uh, like heart, kidney, liver, muscle, organs that have a lot of metabolic needs, uh, organs that have a lot of energy requirements. And uh, CoQ10, just like other molecules that I've shared with you, is an antioxidant or a free radical scavenger. So we were hoping that when we give patients this medication, um, they would, there would be less, uh, less uh, damage from these uh, various uh, free radicals that, that are formed.
And uh, CoQ10 is used in the production of uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's the main kind of energy currency in all of our cells. So all of our cells do work because they get ATP from other, uh, other parts of the cell, and, uh, and that's the energy that they, saw, uh, that, they, uh, that they use. That's a small aside, but ATP is kind of the way all of our metabolic needs are, are carried out. And what do we know about statins? Well, it's a whole, whole different topic about, about statin medications, but one of, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest reasons why many people end up not taking statins or not tolerating statins uh, is because they have muscle complaints. Uh, uh, SAMS is statin-associated muscle symptoms, and they can occur in any gender or age group, but appear to be more prevalent in women and older adults. So this is a very, very big deal because overall, statins are medications that are known to be very, very beneficial. They reduce the rates of heart attacks, they reduce the rates of stroke in the, in the population. And overall, mortality and heart attacks from heart disease have been going down over several years now as statins are more widely used. But this useful medication isn't being adequately prescribed and isn't being adequately taken because, of, uh, because patients experience these side effects. How do, statins, uh, uh, how do statins work? So statins work by inhibiting a specific protein in our liver that makes, uh, that ends up helping making uh, cholesterol. But what's interesting is that the same enzyme that makes, uh, that ends up making cholesterol is also also is part of the same pathway that builds up CoQ10. So there were some, uh, some, some thoughts or some theories that maybe patients who develop muscle pain or muscle myopathy or, or side effects from statins, maybe it's, simply due to, um, maybe it's simply due to the fact that their CoQ10 levels are now low. And if we were to supplement their CoQ10 levels, then perhaps they would have less side effects and would tolerate the medicines, uh, uh, would to uh, would tolerate the medicines better. And multiple trials have uh, investigated the use of CoQ10 in patients. And the data is really conflicting. So I decided not to put together a bunch of slides that show it, but there were trials trials that showed clear benefit and there were also trials that showed no benefit. So the current kind of, the current kind of uh, uh, message about CoQ10 is that it's essentially neutral. There are some, some studies that show maybe, maybe it is, some studies say that it's, it isn't. There's no clear signal of harm. So overall, if you're uh, were prescribed a statin and you're having difficulty tolerating it, it's reasonable to it's reasonable to to consider trying it. But again, some some people uh, some studies have shown benefits, some have not. The problem with with statin myopathy trials is that so many we're kind of as a society so preconditioned to think of statins as a bad medicine or a medicine that causes uh, that causes these symptoms that a lot of it is uh, tends to correlate with placebo whether person is taking a statin or a placebo, they often report muscle pain. So these trials that show that examine the role of CoQ10, whether beneficial or not, is uh, ends up being a little bit colored by that. So, so these trials are, it's not uh, such, a, such a clear story. But overall, there is some signal that maybe it's, uh, it's beneficial. And I often recommend it uh, if patients ask for it or, or if there's a need for it. Can your CoQ10 be tested? We don't routinely we don't routinely do it. It's probably possible in in, in a lab, but it would be a very expensive test because it's not part of regular regular testing. But that's a reasonable yeah that's a reasonable question. So now we'll talk about vitamin D. I, I misspoke uh, misspoke earlier. So vitamin D is another is another uh, commonly used uh, supplement. It's very important uh, to keep in mind that when I'm talking about vitamin D supplementation and uh, the trials that I share with you are not patients who are vitamin D deficient or and are not patients who have osteoporosis where vitamin D was prescribed specifically for bone health. I'm here referring to vitamin D as simply as a supplement that was uh, prescribed or advised for patients as with the goals of reducing cancer or reducing, uh, or reducing cardiac events. There were lots of observational data that suggested that lower levels of vitamin D are associated with higher risk of cancer and uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, active vitamin D consistently suppresses cell proliferation in vitro, meaning in the test tubes. And the question was, well, if there was some benefit in the test tubes, would this uh, benefit be seen? Uh, would uh, this benefit be seen in vivo, meaning in humans or in real life? And uh, 
I briefly mentioned this trial earlier, but this was a trial uh, that was published uh, just last year called the VITAL trial. And there was over 25,000 patients, including a significant portion of African-American patients. These were men and women uh, who were over the age of 50 in, uh, in both groups. And uh, both, patient, both groups were given vitamin D, uh, 2,000 units per day, or placebo, and they were followed for over five, uh, for over five years. And uh, next is, uh, and next is, uh, is the kind of the main takeaway results. So on the right, the screen right, is the invasive cancer of any type. And on the left side of the screen, or on your right, is the, is the uh, major cardiovascular events. And just like the, the graph that I showed you earlier, the lines uh, are completely, completely interchangeable. They, they're completely overlay uh, one another. The top in, in uh, in full black is a placebo and in the dash is vitamin D. And as you could see, in terms of invasive cancer, there was really no separation of the curves. There was no, no benefit. And for, uh, for cardiovascular disease, same, same thing. And these are called p-values, meaning uh, is it truly indeed statistically significant? And of course, as, as I shared with you, um, it isn't. And, and you could see here the numbers of patients who were followed in both, uh, in both arms. It's really quite significant. So the, the, this trial was really very robust and very authoritative in terms of the in terms of the, the takeaway messages. So the question at this point that uh, is probably reasonable is well, what can we do? You just told us that like all of these supplements uh, that that are out there. Uh, either provide nothing or maybe even some harm. So, so the question is, what can we do? And unfortunately, the truth is, is that what we can do is the things that we already know we should be doing and the things that are probably the hardest, uh, hardest to do as well. And, uh, and really, the most important way to prevent atherosclerotic uh, heart disease, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, is really to practice a healthy lifestyle throughout, uh, throughout life, which is really what we kind of know implicitly, in the, but, but it's obviously very difficult uh, to do. One of the things is that at every office visit, either with your cardiologist or primary care uh, or primary care doctor, what you want to talk about is your um, is a specific test called the 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease estimation. So uh, in, most, uh, in most doctors that will be able to tell you, what is your estimated risk over 10 years of uh, developing a heart attack or, or stroke? There's a specific form, a formula that the, that the doctors have, and they can tell you your score. What is, uh, what is relevant? Uh, this, uh, to, to calculate the score, you need to know your age, your gender, your, heart, your uh, lipid profile, your good cholesterol, your bad cholesterol, your triglycerides, your um, ethnicity, and, uh, and your blood pressure. And there's a, there's a calculator, you can find it online as well, where when you plug in all of these values, it gives you the result. What is the 10-year uh, uh, 10 risk? And depending on that result, you can start tailoring either additional tests uh, with your doctors or additional medications that may be, that may be useful. So this is, this is from the American Heart Association, one of the, the big American College of Cardiology. So this is uh, kind of the big governing bodies for uh, within cardiology advise using the this test as one of the initial ways to uh, to start tailoring therapy. Another big component is is, is diet. We briefly talked about uh, fish, but ultimately a diet emphasizing intake of uh, vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, whole grains, and fish is is really recommended. Uh, people. You know, often ask like specific advice. It's essentially there's many types of diets out there. Uh, the one that I end up recommending most often to my patients is called Mediterranean, Mediterranean style diet. And this is essentially exactly what this is. It's fine to eat fruits, veggies, uh, white uh, fish, uh, meat, but but really trying to gear your diet with, towards less and less uh, meat products and essentially eliminating simple carbohydrates like cookies, cakes, candy, white rice, pizza, pasta, simply. Um, uh, simply cutting that out. Um, uh, of course, uh, maintaining normal weight throughout the adult life is, is very important, and there's a very clear data that it will decrease the risk of heart failure, atrial fibrillation, um, compared to, or you will have our risk of 
of, the, of higher events of these compared to patients with normal weight. And what's interesting is that there's, uh, uh, with clinically meaningful weight loss, meaning over 5% of the initial weight, there's very clear, robust evidence about improvement in blood pressure, LDLC, which means, the, which is specifically the bad cholesterol, triglycerides, and glucose levels. So achieving normal weight or, or losing weight uh, if, if you're overweight is, uh, will, will clearly, uh, will clearly have beneficial side, uh, will have clearly beneficial effects. Um, next thing is about exercise. So, so that's another very common question um, that I get in the office is, uh, you know, well, you're telling me that I should exercise, give me some specifics. So the specific number that we should be aiming for, that we should be kind of shooting for, is 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. What is moderate intensity? Moderate in intensity is huffing, puffing, sweating, okay? Some people say, oh, I never sweat. That's OK. Or some people say, I don't huff. That, that's fine. But ultimately, you have to be exerting yourself. If you're able to like, talk with a girlfriend on the phone or your significant other next to you, you're probably, not, uh, you're probably not exerting yourself significantly. And then when you get to that phase, when you get to that level of exertion, you simply stop, simply take it easy, rest, breathe, and then you go on and, uh, and you do it again. Um, so that's, the, that's, that's really the major guideline. And this number of 150 minutes, it's, uh, it's actually supported by several things. It's supported by all of the major American governing bodies for, for medicine, but it's also the number that's given out by, by who? By the World Health Organization. Um, and it's interesting that when in trials, in clinical trials, when patients achieve this level of exercise, there is a very meaningful improvement and decrease in rates of heart attacks um, and, uh, and stroke. So this number seems, uh, this number, this, uh, there really seems to be a very clear benefit. And uh, what, what I also uh, try to stress in the office is that this is dedicated exercise. So many people tell me, well, I, like, I work around the house, or I'm in the garden, or I'm doing stuff. And that's, all of that is completely great and excellent and should, should continue. But when I uh, talk about exercise, I really mean just you walking specifically for the purpose of walking, or you doing light weights, or you in the pool doing these things specifically for that, specifically for that purpose. So that's it. I'll, um, I'll stick around here and, uh, and answer questions if people have. We can, you can answer out loud, or I can, um, I can stay and, uh, and answer them. That's it. Thank you. Sure. Cholestoff? What is that? No, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with it. Not for not for heart heart health. In general, the data on, uh, the question was about uh, glucosamine. The 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 data is very um, is very also kind of mixed whether it's beneficial. But in terms of heart health, there's no there's no benefit. And the studies regarding CoQ10, what was the dosage? So the the dosage that is typically recommended is approximately 200 milligrams per day. Uh, below that, it seems that the levels just aren't high enough. But above that, there, it's really not clear what the optimal dosing is because it's a, it just hasn't been, been studied enough. But, but the regular kind of approximate dose is 200. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, with that CoQ10, are you seeing um, improvement in muscle pain, either in or in statin or, or not? Uh, so most of the trials are, or, or, or the question was about CoQ10 and muscle pain and statin pain. So. All of the, virtually all of the trials that I analyzed for this talk were patients on a statin who couldn't tolerate it because of the muscle pain. So if your question is about people who are not even on a statin, whether it would be beneficial, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's reasonable, but it, it, would, it would really have to, you would have to think about what was the source of the muscle pain. So did they supplement CoQ10 for the people on statins to see? Exactly, they did, yes, yeah, yeah. And so with that, there was some benefit, in, in some trials reported benefit, clearly, and some, some did not. But yeah, that, that, that was specifically it. Patients on statins who needed the CoQ10. You talked about people that had super pain, heart attacks, the way to live, the way to exercise, the way to eat. What are, what are the solutions with people that had already heart attacks? Excellent. So the question is, well, the advice that I gave was for primary prevention, like I said, patients who haven't had an event versus, uh, versus um, a patient who has had an event. So. 
a lot, there's a lot of overlap. Everything that a, a person who hasn't had a heart attack should be doing, vice versa, is, becomes actually much more important afterwards. Because afterwards, after a person has had a heart attack, what you want to make sure is all of the what we call modifiable factors, things like weight, things like uh, things like ex uh, regular weight, things like blood pressure, things like sugar levels, things like cholesterol levels, need to be aggressively reduced. So. So, um, so afterwards, those things become especially important. And the major thing about uh, a person being after a heart attack is, uh, is taking a cholesterol medication, taking a statin. Unless there's a specific, specific cause after a heart attack, you should be taking a cholesterol medication, a statin. Not, not cardiologists. <laughs> A great question. So the uh, patient, uh, person is asking, uh, I'm taking a statin. I'm doing fine with it. Should I take it? Uh, should I take a, a statin? Or, or should I take OQ10 or not? The answer is, personally, I would not recommend it. If you're tolerating it fine, it's giving you the results that you need, and it's not causing you problems, I would simply not, not take a medicine. But we don't know the whether it will help you or not. Uh, what's the total uh, cholesterol level, the ideal cholesterol level? Great question. So the question is ideal cholesterol levels. Honestly, the lower the better is the, is the simple answer. Uh, there are specific targets depending on your, on your overall risk. So a person who has had a heart attack or a stroke needs to have lower levels. Usually we try to get them as low as 70 or below. A uh, person with diabetes should be below, around 70 or even lower still. A healthy person who's never had those events, they may be fine with a cholesterol of one, a bad, when I'm talking about these numbers, I mean bad cholesterol specifically, LDL. So they may be fine with a cholesterol of 110 and I wouldn't start them on a medicine. So it really depends on your individual risk. The higher the risk and the more comorbid events we call it, the more other things you have going on, the lower your LDL should be because we know that that'll be protective. But if, uh, if uh, you're a healthy person, you've never had any of these things, then you're allowed to have a little bit higher LDL because your overall risk is, is lower. Uh, so the question is about plants to, to lower cholesterol. There really doesn't seem to be really robust evidence for that. The only exception is red yeast rice. Um, that's a supplement uh, that's out there. It has an active ingredient that's very similar to statin and has uh, some of same benefits as a statin does. I don't routinely recommend it or advise patients to do it because you don't know exactly the, the amount of the, um, of the active ingredient in, in there. But patients who tolerate the, the red yeast rice, then the, you can make an argument that if you're tolerating the, the supplement, then you would be tolerating a regular statin as well, one where I could know the exact dose that I'm prescribing and we could monitor patients closely. So I don't prescribe or advise any sort of plant additives, but I'm just a little bit more open-minded or, or uh, okay with people potentially taking red yeast rice if they're completely resistant uh, to taking anything else because there, there is some overlap with the statin effect. They say the grapefruit has enzymes that prevent you from uh, yeah, so so I don't I don't recommend the uh, grapefruit juice. It's it's really grapefruit juice, uh, it's specifically that people talk about. And there's a little bit of confusion because it's it's grapefruit juice that interacts with other medicines potentially. So I so I never advise patients to take grapefruit juice because it can interact with other medicines and make your body not absorb them as well or uh, not metabolize them as well. So uh, there's I've never really learned of grapefruit as a benefit for heart specifically. Specifically, but I, I just want to make sure there's no confusion because there's grapefruit juice that can actually upregulate or make other medicines in your system levels higher. So it's not a safe thing to just take either. All right, we'll stop and then you guys can come, come up, whoever whoever's, still has questions. Uh.